Okay, I'm so excited to get started. <laughs> I, you know, my heart is just feeling so joyful and full right now to introduce Carol to all of you. Um, so as some of you know, Carol was my absolute favorite professor when I was at Stanford Business School. I took a couple of different classes with her. One was called High Performance Leadership. The other is called Touchy Feely uh, Interpersonal Dynamics is the official title. It's the most popular class at Stanford. And I feel like I can say Carol changed my life and she's been a mentor of mine. Since then, I basically harassed her to have lunch with me and give me everything from like marital advice to business advice. Uh, and I just feel so blessed to have you in my life, Carol. And really excited to bring Carol and her, her genius and her wisdom to all of you today. So um, just to give you a little bit more of her background, if you're not familiar with her, she's also the co-founder of Leaders in Tech, which is a nonprofit organization offering programs to leaders of high growth tech companies who are really committed to creating high performing teams. And then she did teach at Stanford for, I don't know, 16 years? You'll 18 have to, years. 18 <laughs> years. Yeah. Oh. I, she won the MBA Distinguished Teaching Award. She, she you know, she wasn't just my favorite teacher, let's put it that way. <laughs> she was very loved and adored by all the students. And very exciting, she has a book coming out next year that she co-authored with her colleague, David Bradford, that's all about the power of connection and lessons from that touchy-feely class at Stanford. So hopefully you'll all buy her book when it comes out. So without further ado, Carol, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Okay. <laughs> um... Well, the first thing I want to say is that I have a small um, cough that I don't want anybody to panic if I happen to cough. Uh, it's allergy season, and I have been trying to get out for walks, so please don't worry when I cough. Um, second, I want to, and, and I'm also sucking on a lozenge, so um, to try to keep it down. Um, and Vanessa, I, uh, you know, right back at you, uh, Vanessa is way more than a former student, uh, has become way more than a former student. We are, I consider us good friends and colleagues and, uh, and mutual supporters. Uh, so thank you. I'm, I'm humbled by your introduction. Um, and um, I, I get, Vanessa and I talked a couple of times about the things I might talk about. And so first, I want to say that even though I spent a long time in academia, I'm not a career academic. And uh, while, while Vanessa and I were talking about this, you know, I started to say, I'm not a career academic. I've had lots of different careers. I was in sales and marketing for 10 years and built a $50 million biz uh, regional business uh, for a very large Fortune 500 company. I was a partner in a consulting firm. So um, I, I show up here today with, uh, an academic, more recent background, but I, uh, I just want you all to know that, um, that I've run businesses myself and that as a co-founder of a startup right now, I'm probably uh, pretty close to feeling the way a lot of you are feeling uh, with regard to uh, the uncertainty of what's going to happen with my, with my new baby. Um, um, and as I was thinking about what so um, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher, but I'm a teacher that likes to respond to my students. I don't know what you need. You know what you need. And by the way, if you don't know what you need, it's okay to say, you know, I have no idea what I need, but here's what I'm feeling. So rather than presume that what I'm about to, you know, say to you is what you most want to hear, I'd prefer to start with having you all say, well, here's an aspect of leadership that I'd, I'd like to explore, or here's something that I'm really wrestling with, or here's something I have no idea how to think about. Uh, times of uncertainty in general bring out what, uh, what some of us call our gremlins. Many people use inner saboteurs instead. I like to use the word gremlin, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But essentially, it brings out those pesky little voices that sit on our shoulder and tell us unhelpful things that keep us stuck. That's how you know a gremlin's talking to you. It's keeping you stuck. But the problem with gremlins is they tell you just a little enough truth that it's really hard to completely discard them out of hand. 
Um, so for instance, my gremlin, uh, when Vanessa first called me and asked me if I wanted to do this and told me about some of the other people she was going to have, my gremlin was like, are you kidding? You are in no way in the same league as those people. What could you possibly bring that would be of use to all of these um, leaders that are going to join the call? There's, there's no way you're in the same league as, you know, uh, Gay and K Katie Hendricks or, uh, you know, some of the other folks that she's in. And then I thought, oh, could be my gremlin talking. And one way that I can quiet my gremlin is by focusing on my values. And my value right now is to be of service. If there's anything I can do to help anybody get through this with just a little bit more equanimity um, and wisdom, then I should do it regardless of what my gremlin is telling me. And that helps me say to, say to my gremlin with compassion, thank you for trying to protect me. Thank you for trying to keep me from falling on my face and looking like an idiot, but I'm still gonna do this because I think I can be of service. So, um, so one thing that we can do as leaders is be aware of our gremlins, kind of turn up the dial and make sure that you're listening to what your gremlins, whether, whether what you're hearing is a gremlin and then figure out how to manage it. Uh, you can't ever really qu totally get rid of a gremlin, but you can um, quiet its voice. You can put it in a drawer and say, thanks. Uh, you, can, you can come on back in a while. And back to your question, Mike, I think one of the things that you can do, that leaders can do for their people is help them um, understand that sometimes what is speaking to them is a gremlin and not the whole, the, the pure truth only a partial truth and often a truth that's not all that helpful. So I hope that's, that's a place to start. Yes, that's, so, that's such a great place to start, Carol. And if others have um, questions about your gremlins, please put them in the chat. I also loved Colin's question. So the, the title of this talk, we called it Leadership in Time of Crisis. And I know, Carol, you and I had talked a lot about what does leadership mean at moments like this and how can we show up as the best version of ourselves when we're in challenging circumstances. And Colin um, from Boston had a great question along the same lines. He said, I'd love to hear Carol's thoughts on leading teams through times of hardship, how to manage with care while also having to make hard choices. Yeah. It's like, That's, yeah. Uh, well, the fact is leadership always has these particular um, uh, challenges. They just are way more heightened during a time like this. So as leaders, we are always having to figure out how to, um, how, how, to, how to both be compassionate and caring and inspiring and challenging and, uh, and also do what's best for the business. Um, because if we don't do what's best for the business, then there's, there's not, nobody to lead. Uh, so that's always a challenge. At times like this, uh, when there's that much more uncertainty, the, uh, the choices become even more muddled. So I want to start by saying that, there, that as leaders, I think most of us are used to wanting, uh, focusing on doing. Um, and, and some of us who perhaps have mindfulness practices and, 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 have worked for years to not just be doing machines, have some sense of the value of just being. But at times like this, it's even more important to spend some time just being and not as focused on doing. Because the being can inform your doing with more wisdom. Uh, I know that the more, the more, uh, concerned I am, the more upset I am, the more I am likely to just want to do, just do something so that I feel like, like I'm moving the ball in some way. And, and, and sometimes that's just the least helpful thing to do. So, um, I, you know, that takes me back to what a, a useful framing always, but especially now is 
is how you hold it. Well, framing, framing is useful. How do you hold the situation? What's the language you're using around it? The power of language is enormous. And so if we say, um, you know, if I say, oh my God, this is, this is a mess and, you know, we're, who knows if we're going to survive. That might be authentic. By the way, I'm a big believer in authenticity, but I'm also a big believer in appropriate authenticity, which is what leaders have to know how to do. And uh, so to say, oh my God, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know if we're going to survive. I don't, I don't, that's very authentic, but I'm not sure it's, it's that useful other than I empathize. But you can say the same thing somewhat differently. You can say, wow, these are really, really weird, difficult times. I do not have all the answers. My job is actually to just create a, an, uh, an environment where the best answers can be found right now. By the way, that's the job of a leader, to ensure that the best answers are found, not to think that they have to be the one that has the biggest the, the answers or the best answers. I mean, that's part of what leadership is, more than ever right now. You know, when people are feeling disempowered, the worst thing that we can do is make them feel even more disempowered by messaging that they can't help. So the more we can genuinely say to people, you know, I think collectively we probably have some pretty good ideas on what we could do here. Um, we're, we're likely to both it'll result in people feeling less disempowered. It'll also result in probably more creative and, uh, and useful ideas coming out. And yet so many leaders are so afraid to admit that they don't have all the answers, to ask for help, to, um, to, to somehow they've, they've, they hold this mental model. And I wanna come back to mental models and how important they are. They hold this mental model that they have to show up as the person who has it all together and is invulnerable and has all the answers. Well, first of all, that's not really what's going on. And second of all, I actually don't think it makes you, uh, at least in my experience, leaders who show up that way don't, don't always get the best results. Um, so I think it's okay to say there's some things I know more about than other folks, that's the truth. But I sure as heck don't have all the answers. And, and, the, and the more uncertain times are, uh, the less likely it is that I have all the answers. I love that. And I love the concept of um, kind of appropriate authenticity. You know, not like there's a level, because you also have to maintain a sense of competence and confidence in your organization and have people have that in you as a leader. So that, yeah, that's a beautiful point. And I, and I guess I'll add, and this comes from the course that the, the, the courses that I've taught and that Vanessa was mentioning, you know, it, it, it's, it, there's a lot of research that shows that leaders that are willing to be vulnerable create the highest performing organizations. So it's not about not being vulnerable. Um, it, it, but leaders who are vulnerable about a core competence that's needed in a particular moment don't create high performance. So if I'm the VP of marketing and I say, well, our market share went to H and a, and a you know, sorry, but I swear, um, our, our, um, our, our market share went to hell in a handbasket and I have no idea what we're going to do about it. Well, that's vulnerable and that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. To say, to, for the VP of marketing to say, well, that's the third month in a row that we've lost market share. I've got some ideas about what might be happening, but I don't think I have all the answers. I am counting on all of us to rally together and figure out what's going on because I think once we do, we can do something about it. That's a different version. Um, so at, at times like this, language is really important. Language creates reality. And so we have to be even more thoughtful and mindful about the language that we're using. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a few sort of favorite, uh, th these are, these are mine, but anybody who's ever worked for me or taken a course for me or, or been a coaching client has heard me say what you're having right now when it's an individual and what we are collectively having right now is what I call an AFOG. 
The A stands for another. The F stands for that word that I probably shouldn't say because I don't know most of you and some of you might take offense. The O stands for opportunity and the G stands for growth. Another effing opportunity for growth. Now let's think about, there's no denying that this, that, whoa, stuff is really hard right now and nobody has answers. Nobody knows how long it's going to last. But to think in terms of somewhere on the other side of this, there is some growth, maybe a lot of growth, maybe some growth for us personally, some, maybe some growth for us organizationally, and maybe and 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 hopefully some growth for us as people, as a as humanity. Um, so um, I think one of the things that helps that has helped me, and uh, and that you might find helpful is is to think about other really, really, really difficult times in your life. You probably have had at least one. Um, and, um, you know, I know, for example, many, many years ago, because I'm old now, actually I'm not, but I'm, I'm, I'm a lot older than I was then. You know, let me just, as an aside, can I just say that having kids who are constantly calling me and telling me they're so worried about me because I'm over 60 is really weirding me out. I just don't feel that old. Um, and uh, anyway, that's kind of an aside. Back to thinking about difficult times in your life. So a long time ago, I had a first marriage. I, was mar I got married when I was 20. And when I was 27, my former husband came home one day and just announced he no longer wanted to be married. And I was devastated. I mean, I adored him. I, 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 so first of all, I, was, I adored him. Second of all, I was like, what is wrong with me that I didn't even see this coming? Third, it was like, what's wrong with me that I married this man? So lots and lots of stuff went, you know, was difficult for me at the time. And at the time, I remember a lot of people saying, ah, this could end up being the best thing that ever happened to you. And I remember thinking, F you, really? You <laughs> think that's the best thing that could ever happen to me? Who are you? Like, shut up. Just tell me that I'm right in being sad and angry and a mess and and that's true i didn't have any ears for this could be the best thing that could ever happen to me so i'm going to come back to how do we meet people emotionally uh, and sometimes telling them that things are going to be better is not meeting them emotionally it wasn't meeting me at the time emotionally um, but having gotten on the other side having now been married to my current husband for 35 years, having had two wonderful children and an incredible life that would not have happened had I stayed married to my first husband. I can see why they said this could be the best thing that ever happened. So one thing to ask people to do is just to think about another time when they overcame a great difficulty, because it's a reminder that you actually do have some resilience in you. You don't get to be where we all are without having had some hardship. And if you haven't, and if you've had some hardship, you know that somewhere in there, there's some resilience. Uh, so tap into your own resilience uh, as a way, and this comes back on the, to another thing, Mike, that I heard you talk about, which is how do you help leaders take care of themselves so that they can take care of others? It's the you know, it's the reason that they tell you to put on your mask when you get on an airplane before assisting the passenger next to you. If you run out of oxygen, you're going to be of no use to anybody else. So self-management, self-awareness, and self-care become really, I mean, they're always important. They're, and they're more important during times of difficulty. And they could not be more important right now uh, because you can't be of any use to anybody else. So... I think that uh, we could get into kind of what are some of the ways in which you might take care of yourself, but I want to come back to this whole idea of meeting people emotionally. Because when you meet someone else emotionally, it also takes care of some part of you. So for instance, one of the, we're back to when we started, I said, regardless of all the other craziness that's going on for me right now and all my worry and all of that, just being of service is, is, feeds me in a way I need to be fed. So, um, so I think reminding leaders to think about what is it that, um, 
that I can do for myself that will feed me and give me the, the sustenance and the energy and, um, and the hope, frankly, that I need right now so that I can pass it along. <clears throat> now, you know, when people want to feel emotion, what, and, and this, this, is, this is in the book, eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. February of 2021, I'm right in the middle of line edits. They'll be done on May 1st. Um, but when people, in order for someone to feel met emotionally, they first need to feel fully heard. And it's so easy to want to jump in with either advice or your own story or something uh, that, that, that often we don't pay attention to whether or not someone else is really feeling heard. It sounds so basic and so easy. And gosh, most people do not do a very good job of it for, for a lot of good reasons. Um, so, you know, uh, learning to really listen, I think, is one of a, one of a leader's most important competencies. Um, and it's especially important um, at times like this. Um, so one way that you can help someone, well, first of all, ask <laughs> when somebody tells you something rather than responding to it, why don't you say, so if I heard you right, what you most want to hear is, or if I, uh, you know, or what you, I heard what I heard your, your thoughts, but I didn't really hear what you were feeling. Um, so, um, so first of all, people need to feel heard. And sometimes that just means letting them talk and letting them say the same thing several times. And by the way, when people repeat themselves, it's usually that they're afraid that they're not being heard. I'll add that as, uh, as the speaker right now, I, I am really committed to giving people a lot of rope. I'm not judging. I'm not uh, I'm, I'm managing my own patience and, um, you know, everybody's doing the best they can. Uh, so, and you know, I, I just can't even imagine having two little kids running around right now. So, um, so I, you know, it's fine. So anyway, to, to, for a person to feel emotionally met, they need to feel hurt. Um, the, the, they also need to feel understood. And, and this goes to a really important element of interpersonal dynamics. And by the way, leadership at its core is interpersonal in nature. Um, and so when we go back again, Mike, to where you started, um, how, how you show up for others uh, has a lot to do with whether or not you will be seen as what I call a referent figure. And referent Referent power is a form of leadership power. There's lots of forms of power. I'm not going to talk about most of them because A, you all know about them and B, uh, that's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is referent power, which is the power that you have when you show up in a way that other people say, wow, I'd like to be more like that. And that becomes a really great source of influence because if, if people are aspire to be more like you, they will be inspired by you and they will be connected to you. And to the extent that they feel inspired and connected, it will be probably a little more probable that they will follow you. You know, a really good question to ask yourself always, all my students and my clients um, sit in this question all the time, which is why should somebody follow me? And right now, I would add that. Why should somebody follow me right now? Um, and so I encourage all of you to sit with that question and answer it for yourself. And by the way, reasons people might follow me doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same reason they'd follow uh, Larry, whose picture I happen to see on my gallery view. Um, but, you know, uh, because Larry has to be Larry. And I have to be Carol, but I have to be the very best Carol I can be, and uh, and 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 hope that that's that will be enough for people to want to follow. Uh, so back to being emotionally met, you have to feel heard, but you also have to feel understood. And um, and here again, nothing like testing. Uh, so 
if I heard you right, and the reason we don't feel understood is that we tend to encode and decode differently. So let me give you an example. Uh, it, this is many, many years ago. Uh, my, my, my current, all, all, all references to my husband will be my current husband, <laughs> my, my dear husband, Andy. Um, we had traded places. Uh, we had decided that, that I would stay home for a while when we were, our kids were, li were really little. Then I had gone back to work and he was home. That's probably for another talk. But um, he was learning how to cook. By the way, now he's like a gourmet cook and I would never dream of stepping in a kitchen uh, to do anything other than sous chefery when asked. But at the time, I would come into the kitchen and I'd, say, I'd see him kind of struggling with something. And I'd say, can I help you with that? Now, when I say, can I help you with that? I am encoding the message, I love you, I care for you, I hate to see you struggle. And it gets encoded as, can I help you with that? He, however, decodes it as, you don't know what you're doing. And then his response is, don't tell me what to do. So you can see how we have just completely missed each other. Um, and in a moment like that, it's really, really important to say, wait, what did you hear me say? Um, as, the, as the speaker, it's important if you're not feeling understood or heard for you to let the other person know. Otherwise, you will remain emotionally unmet and then you'll get irritated uh, or sad or furious or something not good. So if you're not feeling understood, really important to say, I'm not really feeling understood. And as the listener, it's, even, it's really important to repeat what you've just heard to say, um, if I'm understanding you, what you're worried about is, um, and if you don't know, then say, I'm, gee, I really want to know. I don't really fully understand what's going on for you, uh, which in and of itself is a way of meeting somebody emotionally. It says, I want to know. I want to understand what's going on for you. Um, and, um, and, and related to that, it's impossible to, to meet somebody emotionally if you have judged them. So you have to start by just, you know, seeing them and accepting them for who they are and how they're showing up. Suspend judgment. You can always go back to judging. But for the moment, suspend judgment and get curious. Wow, wonder what's going on for this person that they're so upset or they're so angry or they're, or, they've, or they're so withdrawn. So, you know, we tend to go really quickly to judgment, especially in business. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, there's never been a more important time to suspend judgment. Uh, and, you know, it makes us feel better sometimes to judge and to, to, to and I know I've got my, my favorite public figure who I love to judge right now and who infuriates me. Um, but if I was in a relationship uh, with him, then I would be committed to figuring out how to connect uh, with that person. And so, um, so you don't have to agree with somebody, but, um, and you don't have to be right and them wrong in order for them to, to, to feel at least heard and seen. I love that, Carol. Helping people feel fully heard and fully, fully understood. It's, it is um, so and important seen. and seen, yes. Um, okay, well, we have so many wonderful questions for you. And by the way, wait, I'm trying to find the comment. Someone said that you haven't aged a day. Oh, Heidi said, you still look the same as 15 years ago. Oh, thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Your OB classes at Stanford. <laughs> thank you, Heidi. <laughs> We've got some interesting questions too. There's been a theme around um, the, the challenges and struggles with the change to business circumstances, whether that's trying to keep a factory running while helping people feel safe, and some questions on working remotely in this new way of, of working. I thought, so Patrick Kahn, who was GSB07. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> and he's, I remember you. He's, he founded a FinTech startup a few years ago 
The company's doing quite well, but this situation has personally hit him extremely hard. Having had the company with everyone in the same room, yeah. he learned really well to read people, build connection, and inspire the team. In this remote work setting, he said, I feel like I'm failing every single day. I cannot read the pulse of the company. It's so hard to build true connection via video. My all-hand meetings fall flat. By the end of each and every day, I feel empty and drained. While before this started, it was the exact opposite. Yeah. I do not have the challenge of hard time leadership. It is extremely hard to be an effective remote leader. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think that's one of the biggest challenges, especially for people whose leadership style is, is very, um, is very face-to-face -face and interpersonal and connected, which we tend to do mostly in person. Uh, it, and, and boy, Patrick, I, I hear you and I could not, con I could not connect more uh, to how odd it is to try to have the same sense of, um, of connection uh, virtually. Um, and, and, and in fact, you know, our, my, my whole startup is based on bringing people together in small circles, small intimate circles uh, to create connection and learn about leadership by doing by just being with each other um i try uh, and i too tried a uh, a virtual gathering um and the first and, and the here's the first thing i had to accept is that it was not going to feel the same there's something about just acceptance that uh th so I, the first one was terrible and i hated it and i felt a lot of the way you're feeling patrick and i thought okay so my choice is to not do this or to do it with a different frame of mind. So the first thing I had to do was say to myself, well, it's gonna be different. And maybe I'm not gonna judge it as good or bad or right or wrong, it's just gonna be different. And, and then there may be an A fog in it. Maybe there's something I'm gonna learn. Uh, so um, one of the things that I think people are starting to develop are norms around what to do when we are virtual. And, and different teams are developing different norms. So one of the things I encourage you to do is, is ask the team, put it out there as, I'm sure everybody's missing that connection. Why don't you all together work on how can, what can we do to feel more connected to each other when we can't see each other in person? Maybe you need to have a lot more one-on-ones. Maybe you need to, con to develop a whole language, like you know, sending you love, uh, sending you hugs. Um, in the same way that when, when you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when email was not the primary mode of communication or texting. And in the same way that we had to develop a whole bunch of emojis uh, so that people could actually communicate more about how they were feeling in texts, uh, and emails, there's something on the other side of this with regard to how to be better uh, in terms of communicating remotely. Now, this will not come as any surprise to any of you who know me or took a class from me, or even maybe from the introduction, but one of the biggest mistakes that we make in communication in general, and in business especially, is that we focus on all the ideas and thoughts and opinions, and we park the feelings we leave them, you know, outside the door. So the more you can talk about feelings, the more it will replace all those nonverbals that you're missing. And you have to make it easier for people to talk about feelings, um, which starts with you. You have to start by talking about your own feelings. Uh, so one of the things that I said in our virtual gathering yesterday was, you know, wow, I, this is hard and I miss seeing, I miss being in person with you and I'm committed to continuing to do whatever we can to stay together. And I, uh, you know, and there were multiple times when in the conversation, when somebody said, God, I wish I could give you a hug right now. And somebody else said, go ahead. And, you know, there was, there was the, what, so whatever you have to, what's working for me is just reminding people that just because, but as, that especially because we don't have the nonverbals, we have to be uh, even more 
attuned to our own feelings and even more willing to be vulnerable in sharing them. Uh, it's almost like, so, you know, in the, in the book, we talk about touchy-feely should, should really be called interpersonal mindfulness instead of interpersonal dynamics. Because essentially you have two antenna. One is an antenna to figuring out what's going on with someone else. And the other one is the antenna that figures out what's going on for you. And the more those two antenna can be in conversation with each other, the more interpersonally effective you're going to be. And so those antenna have to be even more, they have to be able to pick up even further signals, signals even further away when we are not face to face. I don't know if that's helpful, Patrick. I can't um, see him. <laughs> yeah, he, said he, he might type in the chat because he has some background noise, but yeah. I oh, have, oh, good. He said it truly is. Thank you, Patrick. I feel, I feel affirmed. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly thought that was helpful. I also really loved what um, Marnie shared. She said, in asking others in a professional, this goes back to the encoding, decoding. In asking others in a professional context, how can I or we help? I'm noticing the message isn't always received by the recipient as intended. As intended, I've been removing how can I help from the language I use professionally, since it can be perceived in unintended ways. And then someone said, well, Marnie, what are you asking instead of how can I help? Mm -hmm. And Marnie said, a better question to ask others is where are you at today? Um, and just listen. So I thought, I thought that was beautiful. Yeah, I, I, think, that, I think that's lovely. I, and I will say that when I'm worried about how what I've just said or asked is going to come across, I will sometimes name it. Uh, not that, by the way, there's nothing more efficient than the truth. That's another Carolian principle. I, and I learned it from Gary Dexter, my, my, my colleague. But I have, I have a list of Carolian principles. And one of them is there's nothing more efficient than the truth. So if, I've, if, if I really want to know how I can help, I can say, you know, I really want to help and I don't know how to ask that in a way that will that you'll hear as and then i could say whatever i'm worried about that you won't hear as patronizing or that you'll hear as genuine or that whatever so uh, i i love i love having a different a different sentence or a different uh entry point and i also think that at a time like this if we get too worried about saying it just right we'll miss the opportunity to say anything so it may be better to say something and address any cleanup that's required. By the way, that, that actually brings you even closer together um, sometimes, like the repair part. And this is, uh, I think this might be in John Gottman's work on, uh, on marriages, but the idea that you have to get it just right is, can be very, very limiting and very constraining. The, the belief in yourself and in your relationship that if you didn't get it right, you can go back and repair uh, is, is really powerful because who you are on the other side of a repair is, is even stronger, frankly, most of the time. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Yes, I love that. It takes the pressure off. So you've gotten a couple, two related questions I want to read about the, what you mentioned with just being versus doing. Yeah. Um, so Bridget said, having been immersed in the fast paced world of the Bay Area and, and at Stanford, this current place of pause is unprecedented. Do you have examples of how pausing in your life has empowered you as a leader? Or do you have examples of great leaders you have seen transform after pausing and slowing down? And then on a related note, Veronica asked, when Carol advises to just be, what does that actually mean and look like? For how long should one just be? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent questions, uh, not surprisingly. So uh, let, me, let me start by speaking about my own personal experience. Um, I, I, I did not start, I did not pick up a mindfulness practice or start to meditate till about eight years ago. And, um, and I was doing 24-7. Even in my sleep, I think I was doing, because I was always thinking about what I would do. So when I say be, I don't mean just go sit at a mountaintop and do nothing. I, uh, even just meditating for 15 minutes uh, is, you know, is a start. Um, but I, I think the other thing about being is that I've, I've started to introduce 
just a little bit of time between when I see something and I do something about it, or when I hear something and I respond to it. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot of time, but when I check in with myself by just being, it informs my choice on what I want to do much better. Otherwise, I'm reactive. And I'd like to be, I think more than ever, we need to be proactive. Um, and to the question about, you know, what have I, what have I seen in the, and I know that's been my experience. Um, and I, I think to the question of what I've seen other leaders do in, in times of crisis, the more they go into reactive mode, uh, the less likely they are to be as, uh, as high performing as if they just hold up a notch and, uh, and just take a few breaths, take, say, you know, I, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and I'll be back. If you're, if you're, it's okay to ask for some time to just be not an indefinite amount of time, but a little bit of time. Um, so there's something about, I think this comes back to the self care part that I was talking about earlier. If you hold a mental model that as a leader, you have got to respond immediately and you've got to have an answer and you've got to have the right answer right now, you are going to implode. And so is your organization. If you can figure out how to give yourself permission to not just immediately react, um, I think you, not only will you be well served by that, your folks will be well served by that. You'll also model something that you might want to model, right? Because the more everybody goes into overdrive reactive mode, um, the, you know, the less thoughtful they're going to be. Now, there's, you know, I think it's an interesting opportunity to figure out how to, you know, A, how to be and for how long to be and B, how to do differently. You know, there's a lot about which, uh, uh, over which we have no choice right now. But there, so for starters, I think it's really important to be in touch with all of your feelings, not select, as Brene Brown would say, not selectively numb. Because if you, because you can't, you, you can't selectively numb. If you numb, you know, all the feelings of fear and anger and worry, you're also going to numb joy and, and surprise and happiness. So you got to allow yourself to feel all the feelings. Your choice then is which ones do you want to focus on? And how is that focus going to drive your choices when you re-engage in doing? That's what I meant by usually we do. And then some of us, if we're lucky, we reflect back on what there was to learn about who we are. Let's instead focus on who we, not only who we are, but who we want to be right now. Who do I want to be right now? Is a question I ask myself over and over and over every day. And it is guiding my choices. Um, and uh, and I, I, I don't know if I, I, I hope I'm at least partially responding to your to your question. Uh, yeah, I think so. I see Bridget nodding your head. Bridget, I don't know if you have anything else. Yeah, she's thumbs up. <laughs> so I know we have about 13 minutes left and I just wanted to flag two things for you, Carol, and then I'll, you can take it however you want. Um, sure. One is in, in my conversation with you, I really loved when we talked about how there's so much angst around the uncertainty right now, but then there's also so much possibility and this idea of this being a time of creativity. And I loved the nugget of wisdom you dropped on me about leaders giving people a lot of rope, you know, and all ideas being welcome because people feel powerless. So there's all of that. And then someone also requested, and they, they said, can you share all of your Carolian principles? <laughs> so I just want to flag those two things, and I'll let you. Okay, sure. Uh, well, um, all right, let me. I have a running list. No big deal. Just give us all the answers to the universe and like, you know, the secrets of happiness in 12 minutes. Can you do that, please? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, I can't find them right now, but off the top of my head, one Carolian principle is people do business with people. They don't do business with ideas or machines or money. 
uh, or strategy. They do business with people. So you got to get the people part right. And right now, getting the people part right is more challenging than ever. Um, another Carolian principle is what we focus on expands. By the way, none of these are original thoughts. I'm just really, I, I, let, me, let me just say, I'm really good at hearing something and saying, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to incorporate that into a set of Carolian principles. Um, and, and I could go through and tell you who I heard each of these from. Uh, what we focus on expands comes from neuroscience and some of the other speakers you've had on have talked about that, Vanessa. But when I said it's important to be in touch with all your feelings, the, the Carolian principle of what we focus on expands is really important to add to that because I can focus on all the crap and how awful I feel and that will get bigger. Or I can focus on the, uh, the opportunities that are yet unknown but kind of interesting and, uh, and, and then that will get bigger. So, uh, so that's another one. Um, another one is in the absence of data, people will make, now it's the S word up. They'll make crap up. Um, so the more, if you're worried about how, some, how something you've done or said is landing on someone else, ask. Because you're likely to make up all kinds of stories about how they're responding that are most probably not true. So, um, and if you're worried about somebody making up stories about you, give them the data. You know, projection is a really um, is a really common psychological phenomenon. Those of you who are in psychology know this. Um, and so, if I'm a blank screen and you have no idea what's going on for me, and I, then you can project all kinds of stuff on me. You can make up all kinds of stories about me, and and I have no control over that. But the more I tell you about me, the more the screen is not blank the harder it is for you to make up stuff about me. So in the absence of data, people make crap up. So err on the side of sharing more, not sharing less. General Carolian principle, more important than ever. Um, I don't know, some others will come to mind in, in a bit. <laughs> those, are some, those are some of them. Thank you, those are so helpful. And then thinking about, yeah, this is, a time of creativity and opportunity. And um, like I said, what you said about, I, I thought it was so insightful what you said about people feeling powerless right now and what leaders can do to help people feel a little bit less powerless. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it applies to ourselves too. Think about what, what helps you feel more empowered and or just stop and reflect a little bit. When do you feel more empowered and less empowered? And focus on how to get more of the stuff that helps you feel more empowered. I feel more empowered when I, when I have a call with Vanessa and all of you, right? It's, I can't do anything about the, the larger crisis, but I can do my part. And, and in doing my part, I think maybe I do a little bit about the larger crisis, but so it's empowering for me to just to be with others, to hear others. I've, I've been attending more of these kinds of, I attended a couple of your other uh, Zooms and I've got, I've got the, the ones I couldn't attend, you know, on my feed for when I have time to watch. Um, and, you know, just, I am struck by the, by, by human beings' resilience and creativity. And you know, I think part of the part of the part of the benefit of, of having lived a few more years is that you know, and and sure, I've never lived through anything like this, but boy, I rem I remember nine eleven, I remember two thousand eight, I remember other crises, and and it always feels and looks darkest before the light, um, and there's always something on the other side. It's not the end of the world. It feels like it sometimes. Uh, and it may be the end of a world we have known, but it's not the end of the world. And, um, and so I think, and by the way, I've, all, I've never been an optimist. I might sound like an optimist, but I've never been an optimist. I've always thought optimism was for people that were unrealistic. Um, 
but, uh, but I also am not a pessimist because what we focus on expands. I like to th think of myself as a realist. And so what I look for is evidence of human resilience, evidence of human creativity, evidence of, um, of human beings being, and by the way, this is one of the things that I, I'm having a bit of a problem with what's, what we're being bombarded with, with the media, by the media, which is we're not, we're not being bombarded enough with a lot of really interesting and good uh, and creative uh, ideas and, that are being put into action out there by, by people who are not in the limelight and not on the news. So creating an opportunity for people to share that, I think, in a much, much broader way would be a really cool thing. And I bet someone's working on it. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. And I, and I also, what Carol had shared with me was that um, if people on your team are feeling really empowered, it's a really good time to say like all ideas are welcome here and exactly. to really create an open space for people to bring in any kind of idea because even just sharing an idea gives people a, a sense, sense of empowerment. Exactly. And by the way, they will not do that if they feel judged or afraid. So there has to be some way, for, if you've already created a culture of openness where, where, no, where, where people don't feel afraid, then that's fine. Um, if you think you have and you're not sure, it's a good time to test it. Um, and, uh, and how you respond will have a lot to do with how much more or less you will get. Um, and so, and you know, it's kind of classic brainstorming technique, right? No, all ideas are welcome. No ideas are wrong. It's a way to riff. Um, it's fun to riff. You know, when you and I were talking, you know, a couple of weeks ago about this, Vanessa, we were riffing and we were throwing all kinds of, well, we could talk about this. We could talk about that. It's fun. It's energizing. And doesn't mean every single one of those ideas is a great idea and you're going to, and you're going to do something with it, but it might lead to another idea that is great. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't consider myself a particularly creative person. Um, so I, I especially like to surround myself with people that are creative um, because, uh, because it stretches me and because sometimes they come up with stuff that um, uh, somebody said there is much pleasure. To, oh, I, I'm sorry. I was reading a, something about there's there. Curiosity is, here's another Carolian principle. Curiosity <laughs> is impossible in the, uh, when it coexists. Curiosity is, is, I don't remember the way I've got a phrase. It's more elegant, but curiosity is impossible when you judge. Curiosity is impossible in, in, in the, in, w without the absence of judgment. Uh, creativity is pretty hard to get when people are afraid of how they're going to be assessed or judged. And you know, in the end, as human beings, what we really, what we really want is we want others to, you know, we're back to, we want to be seen and known, but we want to be seen and known for who, for the best of who we are. Um, and, and warts and pimples and all, but still is a good human being, right? So I, I don't want, you know, to really be known and seen is to be known for my faults and still accepted. Um, that's another principle from interpersonal dynamics and from the book, which is um, you can't really connect with somebody unless you can allow yourself to be seen and known. And you won't allow sort of the yuckier parts of yourself to be known and seen if you're afraid that someone else is going to judge you poorly for that. And I love, I think it was maybe even a Maya Angelou quote you'd share with me about how hope and fear can't coexist in the same space. Right. That goes back, right. That, that's a Maya Angelou. Uh, and what she, what, and that goes back to, you can feel hope and fear at the same time, but you can choose to focus on one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so when she talks about coexistence, she doesn't talk about the ability to feel them, it's the ability to act on them that can't coexist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least, at least the way I interpret her quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And when you're talking about, you know, for creativity, people need to not feel fear, not feel judged. I'm just thinking a lot about how, um, how we show up as leaders right now has a ripple effect in yeah. your organization. And, and if you show up in fear, then you're kind of, that's going to cascade out versus yeah. if you can show up 
it reminds me of something I was reading just last night, um, I think from Glennon Doyle Melton's latest book, Untamed, which is so good. But she was talking about how Liz Gilbert gave her this advice when Glennon was divorcing her husband and her kids were getting really upset about the divorce. And, she, and Glennon was starting to go into like a real fear spiral and ruining their lives. And Liz Gilbert told her, you know, think of yourself, like you're on an airplane with your family right now, with your kids, and you are the stewardess. And when the plane hits turbulence, everybody looks to the stewardess. <laughs> and if the, if the stewardess is panicking, you know, people are going to get really scared. Then you know you've really got a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, well, but, and I guess the thing, that I'll, the thing that I'll add to that is that, um, oh, shoot. I had a thought for a moment while you were talking about it. First of all, I hope you'll put that reference on your, on your chat of the book you're reading. Yeah. It's really cool to, to, to be sharing resources like that. Um, I think that um, if we go back to um, connecting with each other um, and, and leaders, uh, Leaders emphasizing that more than ever, we have to find a way to stay connected. Um, I also think a lot of people who are used to working from home have a lot to teach us. Um, and usually they're the more marginalized uh, in our organizations. Uh, and now they're like, they've got a lot of expertise to bring to the party. So I would love to see uh, somebody create an opportunity for them to share their wisdom. Um, I, um, uh, and there was one other thing I wanted to say before we, uh, I don't know, I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> Should have made a note. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, it's funny. I think Liz Gilbert did a little Instagram video. She said, everyone, I've been working from home for 35 years. I want to share my two biggest pieces of advice. Make your bed, get dressed. Yeah. Yeah. In my, in my case, put on makeup, even if I'm not going to see anybody. <laughs> Um, uh, oh, I wanted to say one other thing. I wanted to talk about mental models before, uh, I, I know we're out of time and, and if people need to roll off, that's fine. But I did want to talk about mental models. Um, because mental models are these beliefs and assumptions that we hold about what's the right way to be, about what makes a good leader. And we've been talking about them sort of indirectly, but in order to grow as a leader, uh, always, I think it's important to continually update your mental models. So, um, what, because a mental model that served you early in your career. So I was the first woman hired in a non-clerical job at a fortune 500 company in 1975, a, this particular fortune in industrial automation. So I learned very quickly as I got promoted and was a manager that boy, there were rules to the game and they were very, 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 male oriented rules um and uh, i.e no room for feelings um you got to be tough uh you can't get soft uh you know et cetera et cetera et cetera got to be you got to be tough and hard ass etc and by the way i got very good at it uh you know i am a good learner um and but what i discovered and th and that served me well by the way initially 10 years later I was running a $50 million region and I was at an offsite where I was trying to get, you know, my team at the time, still all men. I did finally succeed in hiring a few women shortly after that, but I was trying to get them excited about something and it was just crickets. Uh, and, and I was like, what, what is wrong with you guys? Like, this could be really cool. What, what? And finally I got sort of excited enough that uh, one, of, one of the guys looked at me and said, wait, is that like water in the corner of your eye? He said, are you, are you going to like cry? And then he said, are you human after all? Let me tell you, that was a watershed moment for me. I had a mental model about how I needed to show up that was shattered completely in that moment. Oh my God, are you human after all? Then I tore up our agenda and I said, I don't think there's anything more important for us all to talk about than that. And, uh, and that was that. And then we spent the next two days talking about who we were and what mattered to us and why it mattered. And that's when we became a real team. And that's, and I believe to this day, those guys would follow me anywhere. So for those of you, and by the way, you can do that online. 
you can ask people to share, you know, the, what I did with my peer group yesterday, uh, because these were people who already knew each other, was I asked them to take two minutes each and say, if you really knew me, you would know. And then fill in the rest, two minutes. You had to talk for two minutes with that. Uh, and by the way, I learned that from somebody too. <laughs> it's not, again, not original. Um, but start with two minutes if you really knew me. After each person talks, take a minute to give everyone else to say, when I heard you say, and then whatever they want to say, and then two minutes for the next person. There were eight of us on the call. It took us 24 minutes. We had an hour and a half call. And, um, and let me tell you, the conversation after that check-in was very different than it would have been had we just gone right into business. Ah, oh, well, you got lots of comments. People love that story. Thank and you. I love, and I love that, that question of if you really knew me, you would know to start off like a team meeting or a check-in with that. That's yeah. such great, like tangible, yeah. practical advice people can implement right away. Yeah. So update, um, update your mental models. <laughs> yes. And someone just whose name is not there just says R and shared this really great quote. I've always been crazy, but it's kept me from going insane by Waylon Jennings. Oh, I and, love that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple, and he also shared a quote, there is much pleasure to be gained from useless knowledge. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> my, 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 my husband, who is an avid reader of almost, uh, it's unbelievable what this man reads and remembers. We were on a global study trip uh, when I was still at the GSB, and he was like, sounding off you know we were on an airplane he was talking about how the propellers worked and then we were on the ground he was talking about all kinds of stuff and somebody finally said my god you're like a compendium of of knowledge and he said yes i'm a i'm a compendium of useless bullshit <laughs> <laughs> um so that's what that quote reminded me of uh -huh. and it and it's delightful to be around always yeah. <laughs> yeah. and there's one more quote that, that this person shared that i just think is a, or from a poem Faith is the bird that feels the light and sings when the dawn is still dark. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so that'll thank be nice you. to end with a little poem. Well, thank you so much, Carol. This has thank been really helpful. And um, if you think of other resources or anything, we'll post them along with the recording links to anything else you want to include. So it's just such a joy to have you here with us. I really appreciate you spending the thank time, you. sending you so much love. Thank and I'm you. Sure we will Thank you, thank you. And I appreciate you doing this for all of us. So good oh, on you. Thank you. Okay. It's my pleasure. All right. Bye, everybody. Much love. Oh, by the way, uh, you're more than welcome to share my, uh, my contact information. Oh, great. Email, phone number? Yeah, no, not, not phone number, email. <laughs> email address uh, in case anybody... But by the way, just know that you might not get a response right away because because uh, it's full. <laughs> but but also yeah. I but I also want to be there as a resource. Yeah, and Carol does a lot of like team coaching, executive leadership, and her leaders in tech program is really phenomenal. And who knows what creative new directions it'll be going with our current situation. So yeah. you know, also I will post more information on that as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carol. Take good care. All right. Bye. Um, goodbye.